I also want to let you know that there's a feedback survey, if you could fill that out afterwards. We have one more event for the semester as well. We have an arts and business luncheon. It'll be next Friday, the 22nd, from 1130 to 1230. We have a lot of flyers on the table if you'd like to take one. Free lunch will be provided, and uh, Samuel Wolf Conley will be the one that will be speaking about the business side of the arts. So I think we're ready to get started. Great. I'll, I'll get started. Um, so, yeah, my name is, is Jordan Walbesser. I'm an attorney at Hotch and Ross. Um, we are a law firm, um, as long as Jack is, but we're a law firm that's up in Buffalo, but we have a whole bunch of different offices. Probably not too interested in hearing about that, but we have offices in, in Toronto and New York City and Albany and down in West Palm Beach, and I don't get to go there. I get to, uh, to stay up here where it's still snowing. Um, so I'm part of our firm's intellectual property group. So the things that I talk about are going to be more intellectual property focused today. But I work with a lot of startup companies and entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm the, the co-lead of our firm's uh, entrepreneurship and startup company practice. Uh, so I've dealt with a lot of companies when it comes to uh, not only uh, dealing with the ideas and protecting them, but also getting the company started itself, you know, doing a lot of corporate formation and organization. Uh, Jack is going to talk a lot about labor and employment issues, which uh, are hopefully issues that you do run into sooner or later, if not already. And uh, the point is that this is a small group, it's an intimate group, I really want this to be a conversation. Although I have slides, I don't necessarily want to go through them like you know a college lecture. I really want to make this a conversation. Um, so to get sort of break the ice and to make things a little bit less awkward, uh, I kind of want to hear about all of you. Would it be possible to just quickly go through and say your name and um, maybe one thing that, one reason why you want to be here, something that you're interested in learning from the presentation? That'll help me, that'll help Jack, like, to kind of give you the information that you want to hear about. Sure, that's good. Uh, if you don't mind, sorry, you're on the spot. Uh, Tech with Stunner. Um, we're on a company here in the incubator. Um, I'm interested in what do you know if you have something worth looking at IP law. Okay. I should take notes. <laughs> but yeah, here, go ahead. Let's... Uh, my name is Ralph Kettle. Okay. I have a business already, a business as a corporation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but I'm also an entrepreneur. And uh, what I'm interested in is the electronic charge capacity of carnivorous uh, subsoils. Okay. And, well, they're everywhere. That sounds like something you can teach me about. <laughs> well, what it is is it's uh, basically it's the storage of electrons, okay, in carbon to carbon bridging in uh, in the subsoils themselves. Very okay. good. Uh, it's untapped. Yeah. Excellent. Al Hawks, LifeForFitness.com. I'm in the incubator. I am a retailer. I want to be also an inventor and hire lots of people. I have a huge business everywhere in the world. Perfect. Yeah, nice to meet you in person. I'm uh, David Romar, I'm a business administration major at Peronia. Um, I might be opening a startup business this summer after I graduate, and I'm considering law school down the road. So it's like Excellent. Startup is a great idea, law school. <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh, yeah, no, that's you. Yeah. I don't know if there's anybody back there. John Walker, I'm interested in LLCs and agriculture and how it relates to agriculture. Okay, very good. David Bray, I'm interested in intellectual property, in particular how it um, interfaces with indigenous knowledge and use of different uh, products from indigenous communities. Okay, very good. I'm John Gethard. I've had tons of ideas since I was a kid, but I've never, I don't know how to go about patenting them and trademark them and expanding on that to start a business. Great, great. Spencer in here. I'm a retired patent examiner and I'm just looking to see if I can be a resource for the That's wonderful. You know more than me about this. <laughs> did you did you spend time in DC when you were a patent examiner? Or? Yeah, it was all down there. All yeah. down in DC. So so one of the things and, and maybe I'll talk about this is patent examiners are um, they now can work from home. So they don't have to be from DC anymore. They can and I've had that happen where I call them up and I hear the dog barking and babies crying in the background. I currently work for the Inventors Assistance Center, so you can call me. Oh, okay. You may get me. That's wonderful. Well, thank you. I thank you for doing that. Um, well, I'm the Program Manager. I can actually see my title. Um, and I'm interested in the attracting talent, so we'll be adding another staff member for like also into the system. Very cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm Lori Lane, I'm president of L2 
to engineering here at the incubator, and I have the need to hire right now, but I'm not ready for it. So. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Dorothy Malkus, and I am a SUNY grad student in the interdisciplinary studies. And I have a background in the business, uh, bachelor's in business in English. And I've lived here over 20 years, and I really want to see the area grow, and I want to get some income coming, so I have to be officially semi retired Perfect. That last row. Yeah. I'm Lauren Ormsby. I'm an educator and an administrator. And Michelle and I got some funding to do a start a small organization for education, and we're looking to take the next step. Great. I'm Michelle, and I echo that. We just don't really know where to go next with our ideas. Okay. Excellent. My name is Bob Nicolo. I have an LLC and a leadership consultant doing a lot of experiential education programs. And also, I'm with a group that's actually looking to form an LLC um, that will have rental property. Okay, very good. Very good. And I'm Ted Sharon, uh, interested in intellectual property in regard to the film industry. Two more. <laughs> Nancy Jager, I'm a TESOL educator. I like photography and I'm interested in maybe beginning something with photography. Wonderful. I'm Kevin Kearns. I help uh, out at the incubator in the university with uh, engagement in economic development, including intellectual property and businesses. Great. First of all, thank you all for taking, you know, having the patience and, and getting up and speaking. We probably weren't expecting to do that early in the morning. Um, but it's good, you know, and, and I heard a lot of different things, and, and I, I think I'll start and I'll talk a little bit about the intellectual property side. And I'm going to try to tailor it to the different things that I heard. So I heard a little bit about things that may be patentable. I heard a, a little bit about things that may be protected under copyright, like photographs. I heard a little bit about some business ideas and methods, things that might be trade secrets. And I also heard about trademarks, too, which is really the branding that you have for your business uh, or for your product. And, and these are going to be the four major things that I'm going to talk about. And uh, I'll try not to take up too much time. Here's the deal. This is a conversation. If at any time you have any questions, just stop me. There is no plan. I am on no script. Uh, I am happy if in two seconds in when I get to the next slide, you say, hey, what do I do about this? Um, I'm glad to hear that. So I'm going to start intellectual property, and then I'm going to go into corporate organization and formation because we had a lot of those questions too. So bear with me on the IP part if, if that's not something you're interested in, and maybe you'll learn uh, a thing or two because IP is very important. Um, one thing that I think as Americans we need to understand is that we're transitioning from an economy that is based on manufacturing, uh, that has been based on factory work, to an idea economy. So no longer are we making things. There are countries elsewhere that are making things for cheaper, uh, that are making things faster, maybe not better. But the idea is that's just one part of the economy, and now there's services that have to support those things. There's um, arts and entertainment. There's all of these different uh, ways that we, as entrepreneurs, can make money and bring value to our customers. So it's, it's really easy to protect uh, a physical product. You put it in a warehouse and you lock the door. It's protected. It's, it's safe. No one's going to steal them. But when it comes to intellectual property, the ideas, the thoughts, the concepts, the methods, the processes that we have, the law has created for us many different ways to protect those things, some better than others, some more difficult to get than others, and some more powerful than others. But we do have a legal framework in the United States and throughout the world to protect these ideas, inventions, brands, so on and so forth. Um, so a quick overview. I went through four of these. Let me just go through them again uh, and, and tell you where you use them. There's four major forms of intellectual property. Uh, the first is patents. Uh, when most people think about intellectual property, they think about patent protection. It's just the, uh, you know, I think we're sort of ingrained. It's sort of in our culture to talk about that. Patents protect inventions. Okay, they don't protect ideas, they protect inventions. Uh, and that's a big difference. So what I mean by that is uh, we have this here. Okay, Here's a little clicker that I'll see if it works in a second. Uh, this can be an invention. 
All right? But the idea of changing slides with the remote control, that's not tactical. But this actual embodiment of that idea is. Uh, and there's a, different, a couple different types of patents, and I'll go into that in a bit. Um, copyrights, and by the way, a lot of people use these interchangeably and get that confused, but there are differences between them. Copyrights protect, and this is the legal terminology, okay? Works of authorship fixed in intangible medium. What does that mean in English? Anything artistic, so again, not an idea, but any artistic expression that we have that we save. All right, so for example, uh, if you have a Word document, you're writing poetry and you hit save, you have fixed that uh, poetry in a tangible medium that can be protected under copyright. Music, if, you, uh, if you're in a band and you record some music and you have it on an MP3 and you throw it online, that is fixed in a tangible medium, it's on a disc, it's protected under copyright. Photographs, same thing, if you save them to your camera, uh, they're protected in copyright. If you print them out, they're protected in copyright. Copyright protects uh, all of these artistic things. And there's a whole list of categories that goes from written material to software to video to photographs to choreography uh, to sculptural works uh, to the shape of boat hulls, believe it or not. These are all things that it can be covered under copyright. Um, we also have trade secrets. Uh, we don't hear a lot about trade secrets, but we encounter them every day. Trade secrets are anything that's sort of valuable and important to running your business that gives you a competitive advantage that you keep secret from someone else. Um, trade secrets are famous ones we can think of. Are, they tend to be formulas and recipes. So Coca-Cola, for example. I mean, you can look at the bottle and there's a list of ingredients on there, but the recipe to make Coca-Cola is a trade secret, a very famously protected trade secret. Um, Kentucky Fried Chicken. The, the herbs and spices that go on there, trade secret. They just don't tell anyone what it is. WD-40, the formula for that, trade secret. Uh, but there's more mundane things that could be trade secrets as well. A list of customers that you have, a list of leads, sort of business intelligence that you've put together over the years, those can be trade secrets. I did not know clientele could be in, underneath that category. They can. So, and, it's, and that's where most of the fights about trade secrets come from, is when someone leaves a company, and they take with them that list of clients, and they really shouldn't do that. Um, trade secrets are, uh, by the way, trade secrets are interesting because they're the cheapest out of all of these options. You don't have to do anything in order to have a trade secret except keep it a secret. Um, and trade secrets aren't, they aren't very strong in the sense that I can reverse engineer a trade secret and it's not a problem. If I, in a lab with beakers and flasks and things, if I figure out the secret formula to Coca-Cola all on my own, then I can use that, I can distribute it, I can publish it. It's the same thing with lists of um, customers. So if, I, if I'm looking at, you know, I'm trying to think of a good example. Uh, um, you know, if I look at a competitive company that's making dog food, for example, and I go to Walmart and I, I make a list, ah, you know, people here are buying, Walmart's buying that product, and I, I kind of do my research and I find different names and I rebuild that customer list, that's perfectly legal under um, trade secrets, so you can kind of reverse engineer. Um, <coughs> lastly, there's trademarks, and I think this is one of the more popular forms of intellectual property that we just don't think about. Uh, Everything nowadays has a trademark. And, and all a trademark is is something, an indicator of the source of a good or a service. So, I, I mean, it's, we could go throughout the room and we can find things. These, uh, you know, these say Fredonia on it. We have the Fredonia logo here. That logo is a trademark for the services that the, uh, the, the college provides, teaching, education, uh, things like that. Uh, Logitech, okay. Um, they are the indicator of the person that makes this remote control so I can change my slides. Uh, and, and you could go on throughout the room, you know, pair of shoes, Nike, Reebok, uh, but they're not just names, they can be logos, they can be sounds. Uh, if you think about the NBC chimes, very famous, you know, there's a sound where if you just heard that you would say, oh, this, this must be a program, this must be something put on by NBC. They can be scents. Believe it or not, Chanel number five is, is something that has been trademarked. When you smell it, you say, ah, oh, this must be from Chanel. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. They can be colors. 
Uh, the T-Mobile magenta is a, a color that's trademarked. Uh, the pink styrofoam, uh, not styrofoam, excuse me, the pink insulation in houses, uh, that pink is a trademark of, uh, of the company that, that creates it. So there's all sorts of things that can be trademarks. Uh, the tough part for entrepreneurs about trademarks is that trademarks start off with no value. Uh, if you think back to Xerox, okay, which is a very famous trademark now, the first person to write down, oh, this is a Xerox, it didn't mean anything. There wasn't any value to it because they haven't built up any goodwill. Uh, it's only after a long period of time where that trademark is valuable. And where I see this problem occur is it's only until a very long time afterwards where I get the phone call saying, hey, someone else is, is using our trademark or has, has borrowed our brand. And, and I say, oh, did you? file a trademark application and they go, well, well, no, we haven't done that yet. And it's tough. It's a tough trade-off because you don't want to spend a lot of money early on to protect a trademark that isn't worth anything, especially when you have a business to get started. Um, let me jump into patents. And this, this is fun. This is actually what the screen is going to be useful. Most of the time I won't be talking about what's on the screen. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the anatomy of a patent. We've all heard about patents. Uh, maybe you've seen some patents, maybe you've gone online to, to the USPTO or to Google Patent or something like that and looked at things. Um, here's, this is one of my favorites, by the way. So here, here's one of these ideas of what patents can be, okay? We can have patents about, um, this is for windshield wipers, for uh, an automatic windshield wiper. This is software, this is something that can be patentable. This is um, a very famous, at least in my mind, patent from Eddie Van Halen for a um, it's basically a piece that allows him to play guitar like that. Uh, and it's one of my favorite patent illustrations of all. But the point is, is that patents can cover all sorts of different things. They can cover processes, they can cover machines, uh, they can cover methods, uh, processes of doing things. This is the Amazon one-click patent. They can cover uh, certain forms of software. So it can be very broad and you can cover a lot of things. There are things that you cannot cover under a patent, such as laws of nature. Um, you cannot patent abstract ideas, like, um, for example, buying low and selling high. That's an abstract idea. Uh, business process, you can't patent that. You can't patent automating something with software. And, and there's a big fight in the patent world about whether or not, or what types of software can be patented. But at least at this point, it seems to me that if you have, if you create software that just automates something that someone has been doing for a long time manually, not worthy of patent protection, but there are things that are. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the anatomy of a patent, what a patent looks like when you look at it. Um, here, and I'm going to use the Van Halen patent because that's, that's one of my favorites. So when you look at a patent application, or an issued patent in this case, you get a lot of data. Some of it's going to be sort of useless unless you're, you're in the business, and some of it's going to be very useful for you. Um, obviously, at the top, you'll see it says United States Patent. There's a difference between a patent and a patent application. Uh, a patent is something that has been issued, which means that it can be enforced by the owner. A patent application is simply that. It's been applied for, it's published, but they can't enforce it against you until the patent office gives it the thumbs up and says, okay, this is new and this isn't obvious. Uh, so something to think about there. Uh, not all patent applications become patents. Many, many times people abandon their patent applications because they run out of time, they run out of money. Sometimes they get rejected uh, and there's no overcoming the rejection so they let them go. Uh, you should know that if there is a patent application or anything that has been published after the patent expires, it goes into the public domain. So that means when this patent expires, uh, and if I do some quick uh, back of the envelope math here, uh, this patent has already expired. So once it expires, it goes into the public domain, meaning I can read this, I can make Eddie Van Halen's musical instrument support, and I can sell them without having to worry about someone suing me for patent infringement because the patent has expired. Uh, you'll also see here there's a patent number, uh, the date of when the patent was issued, and then there's some information here um, that isn't terribly important, but it has to do with who examined it, the attorneys. Uh, the first thing that you're going to want to look at when you see a patent is the abstract because it's a very simple explanation of, of the invention itself. Uh, here in this case, we have a little bit of legalese. 
talking about, well, this is a supporting device for a string musical instrument, you know, like a guitar or banjo or mandolin or something like that. Uh, and it allows the player to have total freedom of hands to play the instrument in a completely new way. Uh, and it explains a little bit about how it does that. So it says, okay, well, there's an operational position, there's a plate that opens up and it supports on your legs so that you're able to, to play like this. Um, this isn't exactly what is protected by the patent, but it's just a nice description of what's being disclosed. Do they always expire? Patents will always expire. So and it doesn't matter what country you're in, where you are in the world, um, patents will last for now 20 years from the date of filing. Like all things legal, there are exceptions to that. Uh, but usually it's, it's 20 years. Uh, in, in the older days, before 1995, roughly, uh, it was 17 years from the date of issuance. So this one would have uh, expired in um, 2004 or so. And, uh, but they all do expire eventually. And in the United States, we have to pay maintenance fees. So I apologize for jumping around, but this is good. I like having this type of conversation. When you get an issued patent, it isn't just that way for 15, 16, 20 years. You have to pay every uh, three and a half to four years in that window a maintenance fee to keep your patent alive. And what the, the purpose for that is, one, to give the patent office a little bit of money so that they can continue operating, but also to make sure that people just aren't sitting on patents that they're not using. Because the minute you don't pay that maintenance fee, they expire, and then you can use, um, you know, and then it goes into the public domain where everyone can use it. The whole concept behind a patent system is that we try to keep people away from trade secrets. We want people to share information. We want them to share their inventions to the public. And what the government has said is, okay, if you share your invention with the public, if, if you publish this, if you tell us how you made your very cool musical instrument support. Uh, in exchange for that, we'll give you a monopoly to stop others from making, selling, importing uh, your invention for a limited amount of time. So it's a quid pro quo, or one thing leads to another, so that you give up this information to the public and we'll give you a temporary monopoly on it. That's the whole idea of the patent system in a nutshell. So that's the abstract. You also see drawings in most patent applications. Okay, you're not required to have drawings, but 99.9% .9 of them do. Uh, the drawings show you what is being patented. So when you have a mechanical object, that's actually you know it's a lot easier to see. You know you can all right here's how the spring is set up. Here's where it's mounted on the guitar. Um, you have these numerals that point to different things, and in the specification, which we'll get to later. Um, they refer back to the numerals and the drawings. Um, this is for a physical object. If you have a method or if you have a process that you're trying to patent, you might have flowcharts here that show that. If you have software, you might have modules and how they link together and how they interact. If you have something biological or chemical, you may have the chemical compositions or formulas or diagrams on how something works. Now, biological. Mm -hmm. I ran into a problem with biological patents. If it's a natural source, you cannot patent. So that's, yes, that's one of the issues of things that you cannot patent. So I can't go outside and pick up that shrub and say, I want to patent the shrub because it's naturally occurring. Um, the patent office wants to see that there is some modification that has been done that's more than just, you know, it can't just be, let me crossbreed some, and or let me add these two chemicals together. They want to see something that just doesn't occur in nature. But you physically have changed the original. Right. Okay. And that, that is what makes it patent. Right. Okay. Uh, mine was a, a bacteria, mm -hmm. okay, down in the ground, feet down in the ground, okay, and uh, they, they wouldn't let me patent it. Because it was naturally existing. It naturally existed down in that one uh, in situ, okay, mm -hmm. condition. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I have to change that bacteria in some manner and replicate it. <coughs> right? There was a replicating uh, criteria going on. That, that you just can't ch just change it. You have to change it to the point where you're always producing the same little uh, uh, 
bug. The same bug all the time. Yeah, and, and, and there have been people that have been successful. Uh, Monsanto is, of course, famous for this. Has been successful in patenting certain strains of seeds. Uh, and there's been a lot of case law about this, about when those seeds intermingle with um, sort of seeds that already exist in nature and what those byproducts are. And, and there's been cases on that. Um, make let there be no assumption, my background's in computer engineering. So I, I can only go so far when I talk about biologics and, and the current state of, of biotech patenting. Um, but it's, there are still possibilities to do that. You can patent a process of using uh, items and bacteria and things that exist in nature. So you could have, you know, if you have a system that uses bacteria to, you know, whatever that may be, maybe to, um, put a patina on metal or to you know, create electricity, whatever that may be, you can have a patent that covers that process. Well, mine was uh, the fermentation process, mm -hmm. okay? Or the, the uh, burble, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, means the same thing, okay? When you burble something, think of alcohol production. Mm -hmm. the end product is always gonna be alcohol. But the course of action of the verbal or fermentation uh, should follow a definitive path. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that definitive path can be patentable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and and as as you know, as a patent examiner, us patent attorneys can be very clever about how we structure the claims, which we'll get to in a second, to try to make it patentable. So it it can be a struggle, and sometimes it's not as straightforward as we'd like it to be, but. Um, you know, attorneys do our best, and, and, and the examiners do too, to make sure that the, the public is being served, that we're not trying to patent something that's so broad that no one else can do it, um, and that it's been around for a while. Um, claims, actually, yeah, that's, that's a good leeway into that. So the claims of a patent, when you flip through a patent, you go all the way to the back, and the very last thing that you're gonna see are these things, claims, okay? This is it's the hardest part of a patent to read, it's also the most important. Uh, they are numbered. Uh, we have one, two, not, not these numbers here on the side, but the actual numbers here. Um, these are the claims. The claims are the most important because they actually describe what is being covered, what is being protected in that patent. And what is protected in the claims can be a lot different than what is described. So I like to liken claims of a patent to be like uh, language in a deed. So for any of you that have purchased property or have a house, um, you get the deed and it says, okay, 150 yards from this rock and it goes to this street and it crosses this stream. And you know, it can, you can have a very important description. The key is, is that it explains how big is your land and what does it encompass. The claims do the same thing, but just for intellectual property, for your invention. So here we have something, and I won't go into detail about exactly what these claims mean. Um, but what's important for infringement is, in order to infringe a patent, someone has to be doing everything in these claims, or at least in claim one. Um, they have to be doing everything in there. So if I made my own, let's say that this patent was live and I wanted to make my own support, and um, you know, and there's limitations in here that it says it has to have. Uh, I'm trying to pick out one that might be a good one. Uh, oh, mounting blocks, okay. So this, this patent requires mounting blocks, it's in the claim. If I make my own guitar support that doesn't have mounting blocks, I don't infringe. So there's a whole another branch of work that I do with patents where people come to me, they want to produce a product and they're concerned about someone else's intellectual property and they need my help to kind of make sure that they can get around it and make sure that they're not going to get in trouble. Uh, we call that uh, like a non-infringement opinion or sometimes we call that designing around current patents. It's a big, complicated, and sometimes expensive game of chess. So these are the most important part of the claim, uh, excuse me, most important part of the patent. Um, now, we also have the specification, which is where everything is described. This is where someone has actually written out exactly what their invention is. It may be very broad. They may explain a lot of examples, a lot of different embodiments. So in this one, you know, they, they actually go and they explain. Okay, let's look at figure one. There's a guitar here. It's supported by the musician. They have a strap. Maybe it's resting on their upper leg. Maybe it's resting on their lower leg. And, and they talk all about how this invention works. That's a specification. 
Um, and again, the specification isn't what's covered, isn't what's protected by the patent, but you do have to describe your invention in such a way uh, so that someone else with ordinary skill would be able to read the specification and create your invention. So an example, like he was referring to a guitar, but then it's in here the specifications it says something like that, a banjo or a mandolin. So if someone mm -hmm. created a specific one for a mandolin, that would be allowed if it wasn't that do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I know what you're saying. If there's and this is where it gets it gets complicated. So here here's the thing. So they describe it's for a guitar, a banjo, a mandolin, and then we look at the claims. And you notice that here we claim a string musical instrument. So it's broad to encompass a you know a mandolin, honestly a violin wouldn't make much sense in this case, but you know guitar, you name it, uh, bass. So there's there's always an interplay between the two, and, and believe me, there's classes and careers about interpreting claims uh, to see what they mean. But but that's a good that's a good point. If if you were able to come along today with something specifically made for a mandolin that wouldn't be obvious in view of this, then that might be patentable. You know, it's, it's hard to say, but if there's some adjustment that you have to make that it wouldn't be obvious for me, or a reason why it would work better than this, then yeah, the patent office might say, okay, you have something here. Your patent would be very narrow. It might only be for mandolins and your certain design, but if that's what you need for protection, then you know, it's a good spot to be in. So this is a specification. These can be hard to read too. Uh, we have those those numbers that refer to the drawings, um, the different pieces there. Can I interrupt you for a second? Please. If anyone parks at the car wash, could you move your vehicle? Um, there's a parking lot here. Ours is the entrance is over here. Does anyone park? Is this embarrassing? Get up. <laughs> <laughs> the street parking is fine though. Oh yeah, I walk. Sorry. Oh no, it's okay. We'll try not. I'll, I'll, I'll keep you. I'll keep Somebody your car up. Uh, the important question now, but mm -hmm. um, I, you know, as a, as a startup, yours cash poor. Mm -hmm. And if you're a big company, you know, you're you're already well grounded. What you want, you're probably going to do it. You know, all this sort of thing. So it seems to me that as a startup, your biggest problem you have is when. You may think you're you may think you've got the best thing in the world, but mm -hmm. you went and what you did to undermine your patent before you even you know, you may already be selling something or talking about it, mm -hmm. advertising it, all that kind of stuff. So and all this becomes nothing if all of a sudden you've already shot yourself in the foot by blabbing or something did something to you know destroy the legality of it. So that's what I would be more Okay. That's that's good. And this is where I completely go off script. So uh, let's talk. Let's talk about that. Uh, let's say you have we have a hypothetical startup company. You have a really cool invention, really cool idea, and you're you know idea rich, cash poor. What do you do? All right. Now there's some limitations on when you can protect with the patent. So the requirement in the United States is that you have one year from the date of first disclosure of your invention. Okay, and disclosure could mean <coughs> publishing. So if you write a paper about it and you publish it online. If you build a prototype and disclose it to someone else because you're trying to sell it. Um, all that disclosure has to be is uh, enough that someone else would be able to recreate your invention from it. It has to be enabled. Okay. Um, and it has to be a public disclosure. So if you disclose something privately, and, and it's, it's not just privately in, you know, in your own home, there has to be some sort of agreement, like a non-disclosure agreement, that covers that, then that one year grace period uh, doesn't begin. Okay, so it has to be a public disclosure. Let me just restate that. You have one year from the date of your first disclosure in the United States to file a patent application on your invention. If you wait longer than one year, you can't have a patent. Okay, they're very strict about that. And the point is, 
what they what the government doesn't want to have happen is that you use an invention for 15 years and then all of a sudden you decide to get a patent on it. That's not good for the public. Um, so you could mm -hmm. you could then in theory be the biggest blabber out in the world selling this product, advertising it, going crazy. As long as you hit that, as long as you get in the, as long as you sneak in it under that one year. And under that one year, yes, that's right. Now there's some risk to that. Like I said, this is a big chess game. So there's some risk to that. If you're in the United States and you want to get a patent, that's all well and good. But patents are country by country. So a U.S. patent does me no good in China. It does me no good in Europe. It does me no good in Japan. Um, you have to get patents in other countries if you want to protect your invention there. And sometimes you do. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just want something in the U.S. Other countries have different rules about this grace period. Some countries are six months. You have six months from the first date of your disclosure to file a patent. Some countries have no grace period. Europe, um, although not a country, they have a singular patent uh, program. They have no grace period. So you have to have a patent application filed before you make a disclosure in order to get protection in Europe. And this can be very challenging for a lot of companies that, again, they need to sell products. Uh, in order to to have a business, uh, but then they want to plan ahead and they go, oh, maybe we want to sell in Europe one day. Well, you, you know, you have to make a choice. Do you either want to sell now or do you want to try to get some patent protection done before you start selling? Um, I have a question. Yeah. Like, uh, if you uh, do not uh, actually uh, apply for patent within one year, mm -hmm. but then you make some changes and it is something new, then mm -hmm. you can apply for patent. Then you can apply for patents. And the, the test is, whether or not those changes are going to be new, so we'll say yes, but whether or not those changes are non-obvious in light of your, your previous disclosure. So if, you, um, if I paint this red, that's going to be obvious to do. If I add a second laser here for some reason, that might be obvious to do. But if I change the internal structure in such a way where the battery life lasts three times as long and it wouldn't be obvious to do that, that's something that could be patentable. Um, it's, it's tough, and a lot of inventors run into that problem where, conversely, they patent too early. Uh, they'll file for a patent on an idea that they have. Maybe they have an idea of how it's going to be put together mechanically. Uh, and then all of a sudden, by the time that they actually have a product to sell, it looks completely different. It behaves completely different. And the thing that was really patentable about it, they failed to protect because they didn't know it at the time that they filed their original patent on. So it's a ballet, a balancing act between filing too early and filing too late. And the, the real answer is somewhere in between. Yes? So you have uh, inventors who maybe are working with manufacturers or other inventors. And so there has to be some collaboration. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to be protected from who they're working with or collaborating with. So when a person is in a situation like that, is a person likely, is a, is a group of people, are they likely to teach hire their own attorney mm -hmm. uh, with, regarding patenting, or are they apt to say, well, we'll have a attorney kind of work it out between all of us? How does that typically handle? Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, and I'm going to use that question to segue into corporate formation and organization, because that, that's sort of where it comes into play. Um, for patents, the inventor is the owner of the patent. Okay? One inventor, no problem. You're the owner. More than one inventor, all of a sudden now you have, um, you know, let's say you have three inventors. Each one of them is an owner of that patent, and they have full exclusive rights to use and to license and um, you know and have that benefit of that patent. Okay, so if you have three different people, that can be problematic because um, let's say you have a startup company and they have a competing company and you're both owners of that patent, well, you can you can't stop each other. You, you know what what value is that to stop your competitors? Um, so typically, what will happen in a situation where there's multiple inventors, I always suggest assigning that patent right, that ownership right, to a single entity or to a single person, depending on, uh, you know, uh, on how the situation is, is playing off. 
It's much easier to have one owner than it is to have three. And when it comes to hiring an attorney for that, typically there'll be a single patent attorney that all the inventors say, okay, we'll use this person. Um, I've been in one situation throughout my career where it's been two patent attorneys, where two inventors and two different patent attorneys work together on putting together a patent application. It was sort of messy. <laughs> not, not bad, but it was messy. It was expensive and it wasn't the best way to do it. Usually what will happen is all the inventors decide on one person and they say, yeah, this, we'll go with this person and, and run from there. I'm an S Corp. Mm -hmm. okay. I can assign the, the patent to the S Corp. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and, and this, is, this is what most companies, universities, uh, startups, what they'll do is we'll have an invention, and then there will be an assignment of that invention, those rights. And this could be before you actually get a patent. You get an assignment of those rights to an entity that's going to hold on to that. Okay. Um, I want to follow up. After you. Yeah, no, no, actually, go ahead. Go ahead right now. Back in the uh, 70s and the 80s, Okay. We get Star Wars. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the project, not the movie. The, the project. Okay, okay. yeah. <laughs> and all of us entrepreneur wannabes, okay, we're putting our ideas down on paper, going to a university, and the university would fund the investigation process. Okay. And at the end, the university owned the product, pushing, elbowing out the inventor, mm -hmm. the okay? Now, their reasoning was that they came up with the money and the, and the facilities to test the idea, mm -hmm. to bring it to fruition, okay, realizable, okay? Well, the rest of us are dummies, okay? We got nothing, mm -hmm. okay? Now, how can we protect ourselves against a larger corporation or entity mm -hmm taking over our idea. Okay, great question. Um, so, so here's how that works. And this gets a little bit into the employment context. Uh, okay. When we work for, but that's okay, uh, let me, I'll sort of warm up the topic. Uh, when you start a job uh, where you're an employee, there'll be an employment agreement. In that employment agreement, there's often something about intellectual property that you create during the course of employment being automatically assigned to the employer. All right. That's the case at most universities. I know the SUNY system does something like that. If you are a professor, if you're using university property, um, university lab space, whatever that may be, they, the university says, well, we have a right to your intellectual property. Now, the pendulum has swung back, and now the university is offering uh, they'll own the patent, they'll pay for the prosecution, but if there's any royalties from licensing that patent, they give you a chunk of that change. That's, that's how most of them works. And I, I work with a whole bunch of a universities. Cut. A cut. They give you a cut. And universities and colleges have been very interested in um, creating economic development and encouraging entrepreneurship and startups. So I've seen in many situations today where uh, you'll have a, a brilliant inventor comes up with something, says, I want to turn this into a product. University owns the patent. They license it to the startup company for a song. Then I so, came to the right place. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, right. but, but that's how it works. And that's important to know for, for those of you that will have a job at a larger company and that are worried about protecting your ideas, pay very careful attention to what's in that employment agreement. Dr. Baer at the University of Buffalo has a class specifically on how to basically pull that kind of uh, the things that are sitting on the shelf that the university now owns, mm -hmm. how to pull it into the business or how to make a run of it. Yeah. So I'm curious how to... Yeah, we'll talk. His, his class was that, was that, nobody shows up, but he had a book, he had a class, I don't know if he ever tried to do it again, and he's got his own formulation how to do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a real okay. interesting thing. You get a lot of information they sit on that doesn't go anywhere then. Doesn't, you're right, it doesn't do any good if you're not using it. Right. Um, so that's, that's really how, how things are assigned, intellectual property is assigned. It, it has to actually be done. Sometimes it can be done automatically in an employment agreement. It's important to know. Um, but if you don't, and this is where actually a lot of problems happen, if you don't have an employment agreement, if you're in your startup company and you have three people, you come together and make an invention, um, 
five years down the line, that's a problem because maybe one person has gone and they're not friends anymore and you have to get them to assign it to you and they want big money in exchange. It's always good to get those assignments done up front. Um, so let me, you know, I've got, I don't want to take up too much time. I'll talk a little bit more. Maybe we'll take a break, then we'll go to Japan. Uh, so let me jump into corporate formation and organization. So one of the reasons why you want to have a, um, an entity formed is just for that. You need to have something that's going to own jointly created intellectual property. So there's a, if you're by yourself, just to sort of, let me just do two situations here. If you're an entrepreneur, if you're a startup, and, and you are a company of one, and you're doing everything by yourself, there's one big reason why you want to form some sort of corporation or some sort of entity, and that's liability protection. All right, and the key is, if I'm, I can have a business myself, it can be, you know, just, just out of my own house, I can buy, I can sell things, um, I can create inventions, I can create products and sell them. If something goes wrong, Okay, and, and I'm an attorney, I get to see when anything goes wrong, That's, so we become very jaded very quickly. All right? When something goes wrong and someone sues, all right, someone gets hurt, you don't pay any of your, you know, you owe your manufacturing company $100,000 for your shipment um, and, and you're in debt because of that. You know, all of these bad things happen. Someone sues you over a labor issue, someone sues you over who knows what. Okay. Um, you, without a corporate entity, are personally liable. So that means that that bank account that I had set aside for the business, that can be emptied out. My personal bank account, that can be emptied out. The car, repossessed, the house, all of these things can go towards paying those damages. That's that. We don't want that to happen. Especially if we're in, in an industry where we're doing services, uh, where we're doing uh, you know, products, all, all good reasons why we don't want to have personal liability for something that we're doing. So, I always suggest in those situations that some sort of entity be formed. And a DBA isn't enough. A DBA is just a filing that you do with the clerk that says, okay, I'm going to be using this name personally for my business. It's, it's, it doesn't give you any protection. <coughs> yes? So a DBA is when you use your own social security number. Whereas an LLC or the other ones, you get a different number. Correct, yeah. And it's a completely separate entity. And what I mean by that is, and you have to treat it as a completely separate entity. It's very important, and this is especially difficult for startups and entrepreneurs that are just getting started. The money that is in your LLC's bank account, that's in your S-Corp's bank account, that's in your C-Corp's bank account, it has to be separate from your own. You can't treat it like your own personal bank account. You have to have um, no commingling of funds. No commingling of funds. You're supposed to, please, you know, have your yearly annual meetings where you elect a board of directors, where you elect, uh, you know, who's going to be your CEO, your president. It may be a formality, especially if you're the only owner, and uh, you're the only person that's on your board, and you're the CEO, president, treasurer, and secretary. But these are important things that you have to do. So that if something does go wrong, the courts don't look at your paperwork and say, "This is a sham. You're not actually. You don't actually have a business here. This is just something you're operating out of your garage. You're not keeping them separate." Um, a couple major types of entities that you can form, and, and we've talked about them here. Uh, there is your corporations, okay, partnerships, and uh, and LLCs, all right. Partnerships are what are created if it's you and another inventor, another founder, and you don't have any documents. You have a, found, you have a partnership. Uh, partnerships have special tax rules that they have to follow. They're a little bit onerous. Uh, partnerships are always split evenly. So if you're with four people, it's 25, 25, 25, 25. Okay. Uh, unless you have a document that says otherwise, an agreement, a contract that says otherwise. Partnerships are okay, just okay, for startups and entrepreneurs until you get to that stage where it's time to actually form an entity and get started. So at the very beginning stage when you're hanging out in, in the evenings, and, um, you know, a partnership on ideas is fine. Partnerships are dangerous. Yes, they are. If your partner screws up. Mm -hmm. You are equally liable up to 100%. Right. 
Right. So you don't want to have a partnership forever. Uh, in fact, you want to have a partnership probably up to the point where you're starting to take on liabilities, where you sign a deal, uh, when you have invoices that you need to pay, when you have products that you're going to sell. Um, and, and one of the big reasons for multiple founders to have a corporate a corporation formed or have an entity formed is you need to have the rules by which this startup is going to be run. And there's no better way to do that than to form a corporation or form an LLC that explains those rules. So when you form any one of these things, and, and I'll talk more generally now about corporations and LLCs, when you form those, there are rules that have to be followed and rules that you spell out. So when you have a corporation, you're going to have something called a shareholders agreement when you have more than one. Okay? And the shareholders agreement is important. A lot of people overlook this. The shareholders agreement is an agreement between the shareholders, between the founders, that explains what is going to be done in certain situations. And there's great situations. So the agreement will say, ah, if we get bought out, if we get an option where someone wants to purchase us, here's what we're going to do. Uh, it could be if someone wants to exit the company, the shareholders agreement explains how that process is taken care of. Uh, if there are, you know, these are the unfortunate ones, if there's a death of one of the founders, what happens to those shares? Does it pass on to their heirs or does the company suck those back in? If there is, and here's a big one that a lot of people don't think about, if there's a divorce. A what? A divorce. Oh. So if you have a founder that gets divorced, his ownership or her ownership of that company is a marital asset, and that can get split into half. And all of a sudden now you have 50, 25, 25, and there's some fighting going on between there. It's not a good situation. So these are all things that are spelled out, and there's much more that can be spelled out in a shareholders agreement. Um, I made my wife recipient, but you can't sell until I die. There you go. Yeah, you can you can have those you can have those items in there, uh, and, and that's something where it's good to talk to an attorney. Getting something from LegalZoom isn't the best when you have to do something like that. All right, and that's the organization step of forming a corporation. There's the formation part, which is where you fill out the paperwork with the New York Secretary of State, the Delaware Secretary of State, depending on why, where you want to form your corporation or your LLC, um, where it's mostly just, and I'll say, paperwork. Okay, you have to fill in the blanks, you have to have a corporate name, you have to say how many shares you want to issue. This is all sort of um, bread and butter, very cookie cutter kind of stuff to form an organization. That organi organizing step is going to be very important based on what you want to do. And there may be situations where you have investors, or where you have a partner that isn't really doing much with the business, but is providing a little bit of money. Uh, you may want to have an agreement that says, well, you're going to get paid out first, you're going to get paid out second. Just explaining how that does, and it's, and it's very business to business. That's not the be covered. Is there such a thing as a patent that's worldwide? Okay, worldwide patent, um, no. <laughs> uh, Quick detour, uh, there are patents by country. There's something called a PCT application, which holds your spot in most of the countries in the world, except for Taiwan, I think Madagascar, there's a couple of others. It's called a PCT application. Uh, that's sort of patents 201. I won't get into too much of that. Uh, it doesn't give you any patent rights, but it gives you a little bit extra time to decide which countries you want to file your patent application. Um, but I just want to hit two things about forming a corporation and then I have you know, questions on that. Uh, there's two big questions that I get all the time from entrepreneurs. Do I want an LLC or a corporation? What state do I form in it? Those are the two big questions that I get. They're good questions. Um, here are the differences between an LLC, a C Corp, and an S Corp. Okay. An S-Corp, like what you said you have, is the simplest form of corporation. You can have it if you're under 50 shareholders, all right, if your company has to be a certain size, all of you will fall under that. You can't have an S-Corp if you have a foreign owner or a part owner of that company. It's something that comes up every once in a while with Canadians cross-border. S-Corporation is a, is a corporation, 
So you have a board of directors, you have officers, uh, and the important thing that you need to know about an S corporation is the taxation and liability. So when something, when your S corporation makes money, that, uh, that income is passed through to the owners. It's called a pass-through entity, which means that you will get taxed on the income from that S corporation at your own personal income rates. That can be good if you have, uh, you know, if you're just starting up and, and you're fresh out of college and you, you know, your income is very close to zero. Great. Uh, that means that any income that your S corporation makes will get taxed at that personal level. Uh, it can be problematic, on the other hand, if you have a very good year, all of a sudden you're going to be paying taxes on any income that that company made. And, uh, and that can be a big problem when you don't have money to pay those taxes because it's tied up in other things. So the demand for taxation is immediate? It's immediate. I mean, yearly. Yearly. So I mean, when you file your tax returns, you have to... But if you're on an 18-month turnaround, now you're in a hole. So this is where accountants are your best friend. Uh, and there are, way, <laughs> there are ways to structure that in your S corporation and ways to do accounting where that may not hit your books until certain things happen. I am by no means an accountant. Find an accountant. They're, most of them are wonderful people, just like attorneys. Most of them are wonderful people. Uh, and, and they'll help walk you through those, those sorts of situations so you're not hit with a tax burden when you wouldn't want to be personally. Yes? So if you were starting your company and maintaining your current job, mm -hmm. you, your company would be taxed based on your, your income tax rate given your income. That's right. That's right. If it, if it was an S-Corp. If it was an S-Corp, okay. LLCs are the same. LLCs are also pass-through entities. Uh, so they operate taxation-wise the same way. Uh, the difference between LLCs and corporations is an LLC is, is a, a beast of contract alone. So it's really just an agreement between a bunch of people on how a business is going to be run. They're new. They're kind of sexy in the law world. Uh, in, in, I use that term very loosely because they've probably been around for about 20 years now in most states. Um, LLCs don't exist in other countries for the most part. Canadians don't have LLCs, a lot of Europeans don't have LLCs. And it stands for a limited liability company. Uh, you have officers, uh, but instead of shareholders, you have something called members. So you don't give out shares to people in an LLC, you have a membership interest. And that makes the math easy because it can only equal to 100%. That's the only way that you can you can give it out. You can have in LLCs different classes of members. So, and, and this is where LLC planning can get very complicated. Um, you can have a class of members that will get paid the first profits. This is called a waterfall uh, provision. Waterfall provision. The idea is that you have, um, like, if they're the ones that bring the first money in to get started. Any profits get paid to them first up to a certain point, then they get dropped down to the next class of members, and then they get dropped down to the next class of members, and they get paid. Um, you can have members that get paid at different rates, where one class of members is going to get 75% of the profit, the other gets 25 You can do whatever your heart desires, as long as it's not illegal and everyone agrees to it. Uh, that's in your operating agreement. So LLCs are very, very, very flexible which can be very nice at the beginning if you have to work a couple different interests. Investors will invest in an LLC, but typically they'll invest more in C corporations because they're more familiar with that. So a C corporation is like an LLC because you can have different classes of shareholders. So the big companies that we have, Apple, uh, you know, Apple, Microsoft, Ford, you name it, they're all C corporations. Uh, they have different classes of shares. The, the shares that I buy from Ford uh, may not give me income every time Ford makes income. Uh, but there are preferred classes of shareholders where they do, where they may get a higher dividend, for example. Uh, and there could be, and you can be very particular about what different classes of shareholders can do. Some classes may have voting rights, some do not. Some uh, classes of shareholders in a C corporation may have the ability to sort of influence day-to-day -day business operations. Some do not. I, as a, as a shareholder of Apple, have no influence over the company at all. Uh, but there are other types of stock in Apple where it allows them to vote for a board of directors. It allows them to vote on, on certain issues that are important to the company. Okay. 
The difference between a C corporation, an LLC, and an S corporation is that a C corporation is uh, what we call subject to double taxation. It sounds bad. Uh, typically, it, it is because it's extra taxation. But here's what I mean by that. I'll use Apple for an example again. Um, when Apple makes money as a corporation in the United States, they get taxed at a corporate tax rate. Okay, and the corporate tax rate is actually pretty low compared to maybe our personal income tax rates. Uh, the problem is, is that if the corporation wants to pay the shareholders money, the shareholders have to pay taxes on the money that they get from the corporation. And that's a double taxation problem. So if you have a startup and for some reason you wanted to file as a C corporation, and your startup gets paid, a million, you know, makes a million dollars one year, it's going to get taxed on that. And then you want to get paid, uh, you want to have a dividend, as, as, you know, we did a great job this year, and every shareholder, I want them to get paid um, you know, $100,000 from what we made. Now you have to pay money, personally, on that $100,000 that you pull out of that C corporation. All right. So because of that, typically, most startups are S corporations or LLCs. Very few of them are C corporations, up until the point where big, bigger investors come in for a C round or a Series A round, and they want to, um, you know, they want they're just used to that. And they want to have different levels of shareholders, and um, and at that point, then you can kind of deal with those complications. Do you have any questions about corporate organization formation? Yeah, does the double taxation apply to LLCs too, or just? Only the C corp. The LLCs is a pass-through entity, so you get you know any profits that um, that come from that LLC that flow to you as a member of that LLC get taxed through your own personal income. So wouldn't you be better in the, this situation? Mm -hmm. I described if you're starting the business as a separate piece. The business is, doesn't have anything right now. Mm -hmm. That that we would want to be taxed, pay ourselves, and then be taxed on our income, mm -hmm. on our income bracket, but that the corporation is taxed based on where. Well, uh, that's, not, that's not entirely. No, it, it depends on the, the corporation and how you have it set up. So if you have an S corporation, you get taxed on where you live. So any income that comes from that that flows to you, you get taxed um, where you are, not right. where the corporation is. Right. Um, so it's, and, and here's the thing, in your first couple of years, your company's not going to make any money. Right. And if it does make any money, it's going to have losses usually uh, that offset that money or even lo losses that are bigger than the money that you actually made. Um, this is where the accountant comes in. Sometimes you can capture those losses for your own personal income tax, which is nice. Yeah. Um, you can do that in LLCs and S corporations. Um, depending on the circumstances, you can't really do that in a C corporation. Um, you had a question too, right? Sure. Yeah, in, a, in the case of an LLC, if you're a sole owner mm -hmm. and you want to yourself. How do you go about documenting that in a way that keeps your personal finances separate from the entities? Yeah. Well, you would you would pay yourself a salary, and you would have to pay taxes on that that salary, uh, and you'd have to do I think withholding taxes and jacking about this stuff. Maybe that I do. <laughs> but um, and then there's employee benefits. There's a whole whole other side of this. Uh, most founders, what they'll do is instead of paying themselves a salary, if you're a sole owner of an LLC, they'll just take money from the company. And that actually turns out it's going to work effectively the same way. Uh, because if you think, if you have your company set up and now you're an employee and they're paying you a salary and you're doing, you know, you do all the withholding and you do all the things that you're supposed to do as an employer employee situation, um, the same tax that you're going to get income tax is the same that you're going to get if the LLC just pays you a dividend. Um, now, you as a uh, as a business owner will have to do all your withholdings on your own, um, which is where a lot of people get into problems. But um, but but a dividend can just be a check. It can just be a check. Yeah, yeah, yeah and you you do want to keep it separate. And I, I see what you're saying. You want to keep that separate. You don't want to just be like, oh, we'll put this on the company bank account. Here's dinner tonight. Um, that you should document. So if you are going to have a business dinner and you whip out the corporate credit card and you use that, okay, document and make sure that it's for a business purpose. And then that's fine to use that account. But if you're at Wegmans and you're just picking up groceries and you go, oh, I'll just use my, my business account, not going to fly. That's going to be an issue. An accountant can fix that later on in the year. Uh, and, and 
they'll treat that as, oh, you paid yourself a dividend, and now you're using that's personal money, and now you're using it. But not what you want to do. That's sort of blurring and intermingling, commingling those funds, and that gets messy. So a check is a good way to do it. I know for me, for my first year, um, I had an accountant, and I went to Lakeshore, any bank, I'm not saying Lakeshore, mm -hmm. and they let, it, let me have an account once I have the LLC and I don't pay any fees. And then that way he said, please do that so that yeah. everything is 100% separate. And if I have to pay myself something, I actually physically write a check out in business to myself and then cash it in my home so that there's, it's always logged everywhere. And that's what he's happy with. And then with taxes, he said the same thing. Don't pay yourself a salary since you're the only owner. He said, just write yourself a check because if you're paying yourself when you're an employee, then you've got to deal with all these other things. And he said, you'd be dealing with it. I'm going to deal with it at the end of the year anyway, so don't, don't do it that way. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. Um, one, more, one more issue that comes up, I said I was going to get to this, is what state? I get this question all the time. What state do I form in? I read online that I should do it in Delaware. I read online that I should do it in New York or Nevada is real hot right now. Um, what state do I form the corporation in? So um, from a tax perspective, you're not going to be saving anything if you form in Delaware and you're operating out of New York because New York State's going to want you to pay taxes. Right? If you do it out of Nevada, uh, guess what? New York State's still going to want you to pay taxes. And that's how it is for any state that you're actually operating out of, that you're actually doing business on. Picking a state is only important for your company um, because there are certain rules and they're different for each state. There's a reason why a lot of attorneys and a lot of companies like to form in Delaware. I don't think it's a super great reason, but it's, it's sort of one because everyone's familiar with it. Delaware has very friendly corporate laws uh, for the operation of a business. It doesn't matter much as a startup, but for the operation of a business. And oftentimes when investors come in, they like to invest in a Delaware corporation because they're just used to it. They're just used to those rules. Uh, the downside is, let's say you pick Delaware, and you're in New York State, you're here in Dunkirk, and, and you have that. Um, you have to pay Delaware a franchise fee every year, and you have to pay New York State a fee every year because you're a foreign company doing business in New York. There's more than two. There's more than two, okay. <laughs> well, uh, my familiarity with New York State is if they can grab a penny, that's true. Okay. So, this is not two. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you get into activity and warehousing, you got shelving fees. Right. Oh, and there, yes. There's fees for everything. everything when you work with with the government and, and when you work in, in states, and, and that's why it's good to have an accountant or um, someone that's sort of experienced in that space. Because honestly, your attorney, unless they're very experienced in what you're doing, isn't going to have a great idea of what additional fees and permits that you need. There you go. Um, so it's always good to know people in the space, know accountants, and um, there's a little bit of forgiveness that can happen if you forget to do this, that, or the other thing, and a lot of things you can always fix with a little bit of time and effort. Um, but it's, you know, it's always good to do your research at a time. Uh, so a lot of people, they form in Delaware, that's fine, it's very quick, I can do it online, it takes me five minutes. Uh, that's what's nice about Delaware. New York takes a lot longer. If you form an LLC in New York, there are additional requirements that are honestly a bit goofy. You have to do publication of your LLC, meaning you have to actually go, and for those of you that have an LLC in New York, you're familiar with this, you actually have to publish notice in two different newspapers. Uh, it's, it's silly, it's outdated. I'm pretty sure New York State just threw a bone to local newspapers so that they have a steady source of income from people creating LLCs. Uh, Delaware doesn't have that, Nevada doesn't have that. Um, so for the most part, if you're not going to pick Delaware and you're going to be situated in New York State, do a New York State corporation, do a New York State LLC. Um, there's one big downside. There's one big downside for New York State uh, LLCs and corporations is that you are personally responsible this is rare, so don't get too scared or worked up about this. You are personally responsible for unpaid salaries for your employees in New York State. So if your business goes under, this happens a lot with restaurants, bars, um, you know, sort of seasonal companies, where if, if, you, if the company goes under, you close the restaurant, and you owe your waitresses, your staff money, the owners are personally responsible for paying those salaries. That's something that Delaware doesn't have. Um, for most of you, not a huge, tremendous risk. 
uh, but just something to keep in mind. The nice thing about all of this, LLCs, S-Corps, C-Corporations, Delaware, New York, is that you can change them. It's not set in stone. It takes a little bit of time and effort in order to make that change. Uh, it may take a little bit of money <laughs> to make that change, but it can be done. So it's not the end of the world if after hearing me talk, you say, oh no, I should have done an LLC. You can still do that. And it may not be a problem at this point in time and not something that you need to spend money on worrying about until a little bit later on. Um, that's sort of the, the good news, the silver lining. Yes. The criterion of small business, how many employees, okay, they categorize you this way. Mm -hmm. uh, one, to, I think it's uh, 500. Depending on the rule, yeah. Uh, okay. If you're a small business. Mm -hmm. Anything over that, now you're underneath a different set of rules and additional fees and payments. Yeah, those rules differ state by state, type of law by type of law. I mean, it's different. Patents have something where you can have a small entity based on how many employees you have and, and where you've licensed it to. And, and same thing goes for corporations and taxes. Everyone has a different definition of what a small business is. So you, you just... See, look at it as a loaf of bread. How much more can we make if we slice it just so many slices? <laughs> you see? And minimize it that way. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you're going to go into a billion dollar operation, right, you might as well just pay the money. Sure. Because it's a nuisance if you're trying to get around that. Right. Okay. But if you're between zero and 150, okay, uh, another 50 employees, it's a different set of rules, mm -hmm. okay, another 200, you go on that. But know the criterion yeah. of those separation points. Absolutely. And if there's anything, maybe to just cap this off before I open for questions and then we take a little break. If there's anything that you learned from today is that always, always, always ask for help. There are people, resources, accountants, attorneys, the good folks here at the Tech Incubator, business development groups that are always happy to help small companies and happy to guide them through those steps. Do not be afraid of them, reach out to them, bug them, pester them, annoy them, whatever you need to do. Get that information because it's out there and it's, a lot of times it's out there for free. I mean, I certainly have a lot of people who email me up for one-off questions and I'm happy if I can do it on my phone or on my laptop real quick. I'm happy to do that. Uh, but there's a lot of people and a lot of resources out there that you should be willing to and want to tap into to help get things going. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of ending near, you know, how much I wanted to talk and before my voice goes and before we all need to walk around and use the restroom. Um, what other questions do we have about intellectual property, corporate formation organization, um, just sort of generally and then we can, we can always meet me after. Yeah. Yeah, like for example in this building if some student tries to open a company, what? Do you become an LLC or S Corp? Uh, it depends. <laughs> it depends on the situation. Uh, if you're a student here uh, and you want to open a company, I think the, the easiest and you're by yourself is an S Corporation. Um, LLC, it's a little bit for New York because it's a little bit more work with the publication requirements. Um, an S Corporation works just fine. If you have more than one founder, then it, you should think about it a little bit more and how you want to run it. Uh, you know, if you want to have your owners treated in different ways, you can't really do that in an S corporation like you can in an LLC. And then it might make sense to be an LLC. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's very good to get that entity formed early on because it does save a lot of headaches for any intellectual property that's created, any software that's created. All of these things can be assigned to that one company, and then you don't have to worry about someone running away and having all of these things in their ownership and not being able to do that. Besides patent, uh, I also heard that there is a software copyright, is that something that is... Yeah, let me, let me talk about that for a little bit. So for those of you that deal with software, um, software can be very difficult to patent depending on, on what you do. I mean, if it's web applications, apps for your phone, games, they can all be very valuable, but just not patentable. So software is protected under copyright. All right, copyright, it, like we said, the minute you save it to the hard drive, it's protected under copyright. Uh, that's called a common law copyright. Common law copyrights are good enough to give you protection, but they don't give you the right to sue in federal court. In order to do that, you need something called a copyright registration, which is where you file with the U.S. Copyright Office. 
Uh, and, and there's some rules associated with that. The fees are usually very cheap. Uh, I always suggest if you have software that you're about to sell, it's worth getting a copyright registration on that software. It's something like $55. Uh, most people can do it on their own. You don't necessarily need an attorney to do it for you. If you want to have one look over your shoulder before you submit it, that's fine. Um, but there, you know, it's, it's not very costly. And that allows you to go after someone if, if they copy it. This is especially important in the entertainment industry. Uh, I've had a lot of situations. We've represented clients that have YouTube videos. We've represented clients that do movies, TV shows, music, artists, musicians. Uh, and they, they're afraid that someone is going to copy their work or someone already has copied their work. Having that copyright registration gives you the ability to get statutory damages, which are very important because they're big. So the statutory damages are the ones that you hear about in the news. They can be up to $125,000 per infringement. Uh, for infringed work, and you know they go down the sliding scale based on the type of infringement. And Cost to benefit ratio for a copyright um, for fifty-five dollars. I think it's a pretty good benefit if you think that someone's going to come along and. So you put a production. Mm -hmm. Production's worth three point five mil. Okay, gross. Mm -hmm. You're going to recover what? It's not worth taking up to court. Well, it, it depends on the situation. Uh, it may be if you have those statutory damages and they make a lot of money off the of production and you can show that they profited from your copyrighted work, you can be entitled to those profits and those revenues. So, oh my God, I'm chasing down in China. Oh, uh, that's, I mean, that's another, that's a bigger problem outside the scope of this lecture, uh, dealing with intellectual property and international contacts. But I will say this much, it's getting better in China for enforcing intellectual property, but you're not going to get money you're going to get them to stop. So I want to develop a software program called Spike. Okay. Okay. Someone steals my material, hit the button, wipes out all their information. Why don't we talk about that after? That might be an interesting <laughs> idea. You know, as long as it's not installed by my computer, or maybe it should be. So when I just want to quit, we just to shore to Cayman <laughs> Islands. Okay. And that one we'll have to talk about out, outside of the. Okay. Uh, so when the, is that Cayman public Islands disclosure is pushed? I'm sorry? Is that public disclosure? Okay. Okay. Well, it's not enabling. That's a good question, actually. It's not an enabling disclosure. It's an idea. But if I were to sit down, I wouldn't know how to, to program it. So it's not an enabling disclosure. Um, I'll call it poisoning the well. Yes. So um, novel use mm -hmm. of a patented idea. Um, if you include something particularly unique and novel use, we just talk about that a little bit. And the, the other thing is um, intellectual property. You know, if you get an SBIR or a CTR mm -hmm. or whatever, you have a great idea, but if you're going to invest you know, three to five years developing a prototype um, with whatever funding, um, there's a lot of gray areas should you even bother. So what are the kind of rules of oil in terms of before you enter into trying to develop uh, IP into a product, uh, should you, in any form, try and protect that while you're going through that process? Yeah, good question. Um, in my experience uh, with sort of inventors and entrepreneurs, there's a lot of situations where, and even large companies, there's a lot of situations where people will go after patents and then they never use them. Uh, and that, to me, if you actually, if you never use them and they're just sitting on a shelf or you have them on a wall, that's not valuable. Uh, and that, in fact, is a waste of money. So you, ha you have to really calculate into how you plan on using that intellectual property and whether or not it's worth the dollars that you put into it. Um, and it can be worth it in a couple ways. One is that if you do have a successful product, if it's something that you've been developing for three to four years, even if you have a lead in the market, if there's a concern that competitors are going to come and take that idea and take all that development time and just copy it and put out a very similar product, it might make sense to have a patent or some sort of intellectual property protection to prevent other people from doing that. Or at least making that barrier to entry for your competitors that much higher. Maybe they can design around it, maybe they can license it from you for a pretty penny, uh, but it makes it that much more difficult to compete with you and gives you a competitive advantage. Um, another reason why you may want to have intellectual property is actually from an asset point of view. Uh, a lot of times when companies are being acquired, especially young startup companies, 
they don't have much cash, they don't have much physical assets, locations, office chairs, computers, but they do have intellectual property. Uh, so you're able to hike up and maybe better value your company if you have a patent portfolio or if you have a patent or a very good brand name or copyrighted software, you can say, well, my company's worth X million dollars because I have these protections and you can use that against your competitors and, and they're things that transfer very well. Um, so it's, there's no beautiful rule that I've ever seen where someone can say, ah, this is worth patenting and this is not. Um, Chances are there are situations in the business world and in the startup and entrepreneurship world where being first to market is more important than having intellectual property protection because, uh, especially in the software space, because two, three years later something better and bigger is going to come out that you know, isn't going to make your patent worthwhile. Um, in situations where it does take a long time to develop, and this is especially the case with SBIR and STTRs, um, which, if, if you don't know about those, I'll talk to you about them later. They, they were, probably you could talk about them too, but um, those are situations where you're actually doing some research and development and there's probably something that is either patentable or at least valuable from an intellectual standpoint that's being created in there. Uh, and you can work those, uh, those costs of protecting the intellectual property into the grants in some situations. But does that, that answer your question? Yeah, right. Thank you. Um, yeah, great. Uh, anything else before we just take a quick break? One more thing. Let me, let me just, there's one in the back and then I'll get you. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just like to speak, if you have an idea and or a working prototype, uh, you're, you're already working on uh, the present job, which is, you know, you have, you have all these different ideas. So instead of actually starting up your own manufacturing company, you want to sell the ideas. Mm -hmm. Should you have the prototype and or the idea patented first or would it, I mean, yeah, no, good, good question. This is actually a good one to kind of to end it on. Um, so to sum up the question is, let's say you, you create a great idea, but you don't want to build the factory, you don't want to, uh, maybe you want to sell that idea to someone else and have them run with it, uh, or what we would call licensing. Uh, so in that case, you can, I mean, let's say you have an idea, we'll have no patent in patent. Let's say you have an idea and you go to a company and you say, hey, I want you guys to make this. Um, are you willing to buy it? Is this, here's a prototype that works really great. Uh, do you want to use it? And they could say yes, and they could give you some money, and, and that's the end of it. Uh, in that situation, you could go to a company and they say, wow, that's a great idea, but we're not interested right now. And then a year later, they could make something on their own. And they say, this is a really great idea. And then there's nothing you can do to stop them from that. Um, that's a no patent situation, so it can work, but there's some risks there. If you do get some sort of IP protection on that, let's say you file for a patent application or you get a patent on your invention and you have a prototype and you go to a company and you say, I'd really love for you guys to build this, I have a patent, um, you know, let's figure out a deal. You can still do that and what you would do is you would keep that patent and they can be the exclusive producer for all you care and then you get a license and you'll get revenue back, whatever, however you decide that to be, either pennies for each one made or maybe you know, X thousand dollars a year, however you want to set it up. Uh, and then that's based on the life of that patent. So for 20 years, you'll have that revenue stream going back and forth. Um, alternatively, if you go to them and you say, oh, what do you think about this? Do you want to build this? And they go, eh, not today, it's a good idea, but we're going to wait on it. And then you see that they started building their own. Now you have a patent where you can go after them for infringing on your idea. Um, these are, there's a, there's a cost effectiveness that you have to balance because to go after someone for patent infringement is not free uh, unless it's really a, a dead on case where they're clearly infringing and they clearly, you know, then it's a little bit different. But there's some costs associated with that. So you have to decide whether or not it's worth it. But in those situations, you, you know, what you own is the idea, and you need to protect that in some form um, if, you, if you're not planning on building it yourself. Because the only way that you can make money off of that is by you know, selling that idea or licensing that idea to another partner. Okay. All right, with that, I am thirsty. My voice is out. Um, why don't we take a 10-minute break? I don't know where Monica is. Take a 10-minute break. Yes. Yes.